Amen, amen, amen. Good morning. Good morning to everyone who's joining us on uh, Facebook or YouTube. Maybe you're not watching it in the morning, so it's good afternoon if, it's, if you're just waking up this afternoon to, to watch the service. But uh, we are going to be in Luke's gospel this morning, Luke chapter 16. So if you have a device or you brought your Bible, look there. Uh, we have been in this series. We've been calling it Heaven and Hell. And uh, we sort of started the series kind of chronologically walking through the biblical story, kind of like if you lived in the Old Testament, it's kind of where we started, and you thought about what happens when you die, the people who lived in the Old Testament, they spoke Hebrew, and the word they used for death was called Sheol, and we talked about how that was kind of like this shadowy place, there wasn't a whole lot of information, you just, you kind of went there and it was kind of sleepy, it was kind of like church on Sunday morning, you know. There wasn't much hope, really. But then at the cross, Jesus says to a thief dying there, today you're going to be with me in paradise. And suddenly the people who know Christ now live with this unconquerable hope that death could be the promise of a better place, that they could be in the presence of God, that they could be in paradise, that they could be with him, they could be what Paul later calls heaven, could be in heaven. But then that's not even the end of the story. We, we've talked about in this series that, that there's going to be a time when Jesus comes back, when the dead rise, there's going to be a resurrection, and then there's going to be a new creation in which God makes the world new and everything is put back to right. And all of that is kind of like the good news, right? For all of us in this room today who know Christ, that is the good news of our life. But remember that at Calvary, there wasn't just one cross or two crosses there were three crosses. And Jesus died at Calvary, and the man next to him who said what he said, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, died. But there was another man, a man who rejected Jesus. And so the question is, like, what happens to people who don't put their faith in Christ? And we're talking a little bit about that today. We're talking about the bad news of the good news story. Our message this morning is entitled, After Death, the judgment. And I want this morning to, to read what is probably the most famous story about the subject in the Bible. We call this story the story of the rich man in Lazarus. And this story is one in which anybody who's ever read it would realize that this is such an incredible story. We could spend all day talking about what it means and how to understand it and is it literal or is it a parable is it historical or, or so on? But this morning, what I want to do is I just want to read it, and then I want us to go, what does Jesus really want us to get out of it today, okay? So let's read Luke chapter 16, verse 19, what we call the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, by the way, the 16th chapter comes after what chapter? Uh, 15th, thank you. And the 15th chapter is about the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost son, in the 16th chapter we find out what happens if you stay lost. Verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple. Now, if we saw somebody dressed in purple, we might think they were Barney or something, but that's a totally different era, right? That culture then, if you had purple, that signified that you had incredible wealth. I mean, you had Bill Gates kind of wealth. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine lemon, uh, li linen, not lemon, and lived in luxury every day. Like, not just every once in a while, but every day. And so that's, the, that's one guy in the story. Verse 20, at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Some of your translations may say Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades. Now, some of your translations say hell, but the word in Greek is Hades. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. 
because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he's comforted here and you're in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, a, a big pit, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. In other words, they've got the Old Testament. No, uh, Father Abraham, he said, if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. And he said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Hint, hint, Jesus, right? This is an incredible story, isn't it? I mean, I, it's just one of those stories you just can read over and over and over again and just be fascinated by it and, and so curious, like, what is Jesus trying to tell us in this story? How much of this is, is literal and how much of this is just sort of metaphorical or parable and all the other things? And there is a time and a place to have those discussions. But this morning, I've got a little bit of time, and I want us to get what I think Jesus is trying to tell us in this story. And I think there's a couple of really crucial things that we need to see in this story today for our lives. And the first one is this. Without any question, this story is trying to make this point. Everyone faces judgment, right? That's what the story is trying to tell us. There's a rich guy, there's the Lazarus guy. Everybody faces judgment. Doesn't matter who you are. In the world of Jesus' time, people thought if you were rich, you were righteous because God was rewarding you. And if you were poor like Lazarus, you must have been really sinful, and that's how you got there. But this whole story is telling us no matter who you are or where you are, what people think about who you are, everyone faces judgment. This is the way the book of Hebrews makes this point in Hebrews 9, 27. It says, just as people are destined to die once, I mean, I don't know a lot of people that don't die once. Sooner or later, everybody's going to die. I don't know if you've seen those recent statistics that come out, but they show that 10 out of 10 people die. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. I don't know if you know the name Charles Finney, if you've if you're taking uh, American history right now in school, you probably ran into him, or you soon will, because he was a leading figure of the 1800s in America. Charles Finney was born at the end of the 1700s, but he lived through most of the 1800s. You say, well, who was he? He was one of the most profoundly influential spiritual leaders in this nation. He was the father of modern revivalism. He was a leader of what we call the Second Great Awakening in America. One of the greatest spiritual movements in the history of the world happened in this country in the 1830s under the leadership of Charles Finney. What's interesting, though, is that Finney never had a plan to be a spiritual man at all. He was a lawyer turned Presbyterian preacher. And in his early days as a lawyer or training to be a lawyer, a mentor of sorts to him, a judge, began to ask him a series of questions about his life that ended up being the turning point of his life. One day he asked Finney, he said, uh, he said, Charles, what are you going to do after you finish law school? And he said, uh, well, after I finish law school, I'm going to be a lawyer. <laughs> he said, well, what are you going to do after that? He said, well, I, you know, I don't know. I'll, maybe I'll be, run, be a judge, or maybe I'll be in, run for office, or and then he began to just continue to ask that question. What are you going to do after that? What are you going to do after that? And he began to describe his life and what he had hoped to do and what he planned to do. Until finally he said, well, what are you going to do after that? He said, well, I'm going to retire. And he said, well, what are you going to do after that? He said, well, I, I guess I'm going to die. And then he asked this question. What are you going to do after that? <laughs> and uh, Finney was kind of dumbfounded by this. He says, uh, you know... I don't know, after that, I'll just be dead, right? I'm nothing, I guess. And the judge said, no, Charles. 
after that comes the judgment. That's what the, the story is trying to tell us, isn't it? That's what the author of Hebrews is, is trying to tell us. That's what Paul was trying to tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when he, in that beautiful chapter where he says to be apart from the body is to be present with the Lord. In the 10th verse of 2 Corinthians 5, he says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This in Greek is the word bema. That's how they did court in those days. You'd sit at the bema, the judgment seat, and they would hold court. We must all appear before the, the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And that's what's happening in the story that we just read. Now let's just... Um, sort of back up for a moment and think about this story and the other big thing that it shows us and that we need to pay attention to today. Because one of the things this story shows us is not just what happens to Lazarus, but what happens to this other guy. You know, we remember that at the cross, there wasn't just, again, one person or two people. There was a third person, one who rejected Jesus. And one of the things this story is showing us that we need to pay attention to today is that unbelievers go somewhere. Now, we're tempted to, to immediately say, well, they go to hell. But in Greek, they go to Hades. The word Hades is itself used in this language to describe the same place that the Old Testament used when it talked about Sheol, the underworld. And I know that you're, you should not be expected to know ancient language when you come to church on Sunday morning, but I'm going to give you a little quick tutorial. The moment that I want us to think about is Pentecost. Peter stands up and he preaches that fantastic sermon, you know, 3,000 people get saved and baptized. It, when Peter's trying to tell everybody about how God had raised Jesus from the dead and he makes a, a point. He says, look over there. You see over there, there's, a, there's the tomb of King David, buried there a thousand years earlier. You go in there and David's dusty bones are stored in a box in that tomb. But David wrote in Psalm 16 these words, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. I put in brackets there the Hebrew, Sheol. Nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. Peter, Peter refers to this passage in his Acts sermon. In fact, look, look at it, Acts 2.26. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. And here you can see in brackets... There's the Greek word, Hades. You will not let your Holy One see decay. Now, Peter makes this point. He says, look, this is not about David. David died. He's still in the tomb. Jesus, is. he's not in that tomb. He's alive. His tomb is empty. And so the, David's talking about Jesus. But what he does when, he, when we have this interchange is what we can see is, is that the early Christians describe the place you go when you die like Sheol and Hades, is the same thing. But what's interesting is when we read the story of the rich man and Lazarus, he's not in some place of sleepy shadows, is he? He's not just kind of kicked back and resting. He's just, it's described as a place of agony, a place of fire, a place of torment. It's a different kind of place entirely. And so what I want us to do today is to learn some lessons from the, lame, uh, from the rich man and Lazarus. In other words, how do we take this story today and apply it to our lives? What is it that we must get today in order to really understand what Jesus wants us to know? And I just want to just kind of quickly share with you a few things that I think are so important in this story. And um, the, all of these are negatives, okay? They're all don'ts. I was taught in seminary in preaching class, don't use don'ts. <laughs> so, so I use them all the time, you know. Now what I want to do is I want to give you the don'ts, but then I want to turn them into the what you should do, okay? So the first one is this, don't take God's warnings for granted, right? 
Isn't that what Jesus is saying in the rich man and the Lazarus story? Don't take God's warnings for granted. Don't take the big blinking heavenly light saying, watch out, look out, danger, caution, turn around now. You know, we have that saying when it rains, turn around, don't drown, you know? Look out, just, just heed the warning. Now, if you're going to take it into something positive, you, you're not going to say don't take God's warnings for granted. You might say take God real seriously, right? Take his warnings seriously. Take God seriously today when he says there is this place that you don't want to go to. Now, Peter will do this again uh, in his letter to second, in his, like, uh, in his letter called Second Peter in which he'll give these same kinds of warnings, and he'll use two uh, illustrations from the Old Testament that you know pretty well. The first one he'll use is the story of Noah. Remember in the days of Noah, he'll say, remember Noah, and he saved Noah, and he, everybody else died. Which, by the way, the story of, of Noah and the ark is like a favorite children's story, but if you really think about it, it's kind of like the scariest story in the Old Testament, and like, why do we make it into a fun kid story? You know, it's, <laughs> it's really dark. It may be the worst chapter in the whole Bible, if you really think about it. God destroys the whole world. Hey, kids, let's come to church and talk about it. <laughs> but, the, but the point of the story that Peter's trying to make is, look, he saved Noah, and held the world to judgment. Then he uses the story of those cities near the, near the Dead Sea called Sodom and Gomorrah. And he talks about how he's going to obliterate it. And yet, he sends some people in, some angels, and they rescue Lot. And then comes the hellfire and brimstone down. And Peter's making these points. And then he makes this statement in 2 Peter 2.9. He says this, if this is so... Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, i.e. Noah and Lot, and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. That there's going to be a day in which we will be judged, and God knows how to do that. Warning, 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 right? The book of Hebrews describes God in all kinds of different ways, but one of the most powerful is in Hebrews 12, 28 and 29, when at the end of that it says, God is a consuming fire. Don't mess around with God. Now, I think the other way you could look at this story today and say, what is it God's trying to get us to hear today? Is not only don't take God's warnings for granted, but number two, it's don't go into eternity without Christ, right? Right? Don't be the other guy on the crosses of Calvary. Don't be the guy who says, no, I don't really believe. Don't enter your eternity without knowing Jesus. In 1623, a French mathematician was born. He would go on to become one of the most influential men in European history and in Western civilization a fantastic scientist and philosopher. His name was Blaise Pascal, and one of the things that's incredible about Pascal is that he was a devout Christian man. And he gave to us one of the, one of the ironclad defenses of Christianity. It's famously referred to as Pascal's wager, which for those of you who don't like gambling might be offended at, and the other half of you, or 90% of you, will love. It's a joke, by the way. This is his wager. Belief is a wise wager. Granted, faith cannot be proved. What harm will come to you if you gamble on its truth and it proves false? If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then without hesitation that he exists. You see what Pascal's saying? He's saying, look, let's say you live your whole life. And you live your whole life for Christ and you die. 
and all this Christianity was somebody's mythology. What did you lose? He says, you know what? You lost nothing. He says, but what if? What if you live your whole life saying, there's no God, there's no judgment, there's no heaven and hell, there's none of that, and then you die and you discover there is, you have lost everything. So if you're going to make a bet, the wise wager is to always bet on God. I remember a few years ago when the economy went kaput in this country, and everybody was selling their stocks. You remember that? I mean, all the stock market crashed. The government was bailing out every company that was in trouble. And then there was this billionaire investor by the name of Warren Buffett who had all this liquidity, all this cash. And Buffett went on a spending spree. And the Wall Street Journal covered this story and said, Warren Buffett, why are you buying all these stocks? And he said, he said, I always bet on America. She's never let me down. Of course, that's how Warren Buffett made billions of dollars. It's the same kind of thing that Pascal is saying. Why would you bet on anyone but God? Why would you ever put your life on anyone besides God? Don't go into eternity without Christ. This is what the rich man is saying to Abraham. He's saying, send Lazarus back to my brothers. I don't want them to come here. Send, give them a warning. Tell them what's happening. Don't let them enter this place without knowing. Now, there's only maybe one other thing to say here, and that's one final don't. <laughs> don't wait too long to decide. If I was a television commercial, I would say, there's limited time. Act now. <laughs> but there is limited time, isn't there? In other words, we really are all going to one day run out of time. We don't know when that day is, presumably. But one day, we will run out of time. Don't wait too long. If this rich man could probably say anything, he probably said, I waited too long to make the right decision. Clive Staples Lewis C.S. Lewis, was an atheist who had become a Christian. This Oxford Don, this famous literary genius, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and probably the single greatest defender of the Christian faith in a thousand years. Lewis produced all kinds of works in defending the Christian faith and showing its reasonableness and rationalness. But he also wrote these fictional works about Christianity, and they're among the most interesting things in the world to read. One of them is, a, is an imaginary story about what, it's, what the devil and his evil minions are up to in trying to get all of us to not believe in the Christian faith. And you may remember there is a scene in the Screwtape Letters where they're having this conversation, the devil and his minions, and they're saying, let's try this to get people not to believe in God, and let's try this and try that. And at one point, uh, one of them suggests, well, we'll just try to convince people there really is no God, and the devil says, well, that'll never work, because they can go outside and look up at the sky <laughs> and know there is a God. He says, well, we'll just point out the point out the hypocrisy of human character and how there's Christians that are hypocrites and the devil says that'll never work at the, the heart of the Christian faith is a message of forgiveness. And they went back and forth with these different ideas until finally one of these evil minions says, I know, I, I've got it, I've got it. Well, just tell everybody there's no hurry. There's no hurry you want to accept Christ, that's fine. You want to believe in the Bible, that's fine. You want to live a Christian life, that's fine. Just take your time. No hurries. Lewis put it like this, the chief weapon of the enemy is not to tell Christians there's no God, not to point out the hypocrites, but just to say there is no hurry. But eventually, we run out of time, don't we? And if we haven't made that decision before the time is up, we miss the chance to make it. And after that, 
comes the judgment. Would you pray with me? Father, we just rejoice today at the good news that says that today, if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we can have the firm confidence of knowing that to be apart from the body is to be present with the Lord, to know that we can be in your presence in this place you call paradise. Father, we rejoice in in the knowledge that for those of us who know Jesus, that the future is bright. There's a day of resurrection and a day of reward and a day of new worlds and new creation. But Lord, we also, we also grieve today to know that there is another possibility, perhaps even for someone here today or someone that we know who's facing the grim possibility of living in eternity without Christ. And God, our, our hearts go out to those people and And if there's someone here today that is in that situation, Lord, our prayer is that your spirit would touch their heart and say, today's the day. Don't wait any longer. Don't put it off anymore. Don't go into your eternity without Jesus. But Lord, for all of us who do know this message is the good news. This story is also a reminder that that we're supposed to be sharing this good news with other people. That we're supposed to be extending this message to others saying, come receive this good news for yourself. Don't just be a beggar. Come and receive the bread of life that Jesus Christ is willing to offer you free of charge today by his grace, by his cross. In Jesus' name. If you would to stand at this time, some of us will be down here at the front. If God's just maybe speaking to your heart today, say, today's the day. I need to make that decision. Maybe it's the day I want to be a part of this church or be baptized. Or if you just want to pray, you come as we sing.